podcast, your twice weekly dedicated channel, keeping you up to date with the most uh, important information you need to know about the COVID virus, as well as uh, many of the other issues facing us as South Africans during this time. Well, today is day 54 of South Africa's extended lockdown, and it's day 19 uh, of level four. And I'm sure for many South Africans, it's starting to bite uh, very, very hard uh, into people's uh, wallets and into people's viability as households. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very, very much to all of the CoronaCast viewers and supporters who have contributed so generously to the DA's court case, uh, taking on the constitutionality of the Disaster Management Act, as well as our high court action against the military curfew, uh, the ban on e-commerce, uh, which government has done a U-turn on, as well as the uh, exercise uh, uh, limitation of three hours in the morning. We'll obviously use this channel to keep you up to date. But for those of you who would still like to make a donation, those of you who are feeling helpless and sidelined during this process, this is an opportunity for you to get involved. Please uh, visit the DA website and uh, you can, it's www.da.org.za and click on the donate button and it'll allow you uh, to make a donation. Sorry for all of you who uh, tried to do it last week, but we were so overwhelmed by South Africans wanting to contribute uh, that unfortunately there was a little bit of time where the, the site went down, but we've addressed that and uh, there should be no problems going forward. So please, those of you who'd like to make your voices heard uh, as South Africans, please use this opportunity. Things are getting really tough for South Africa and for many, many South Africans. And it was really heartwarming over the course of the weekend to see so many South Africans using the hashtag John Speaks For Me, sharing their stories around the difficulties that they are facing. Many of them really heartbreaking stories. Families going hungry, uh, people who've lost their jobs, people who worry about the future. And so today's show, as a result of that, we've decided to focus on two of the real pressing issues that are affecting South Africans. One, the employment space, the UIF, joblessness, unemployment, and the second, the issue around food and food distribution. And so today in studio, I'm joined uh, by Michael Bagram, who is the DA's Deputy Shadow Minister on, uh, on Labour, who's also one of the country's foremost Labour lawyers with a very, very deep and long experience uh, in Labour law and all imp uh, implications thereof. So please do send your questions through that you have for Michael. He'll be talking about the UIF uh, and, the, and uh, all those, then the tourist funds, all those issues. And then uh, joining us via Skype from Johannesburg is uh, DA MP James Lorimer, who's been heading up our work stream looking at food and food security in the country, given the fact that we are now starting to hit a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions and government's irrational clampdown on the ability of NGOs and others to be able to provide uh, food to poor and hungry South Africans across the length and breadth uh, of the country. So I would also ask if you've got friends or family who are struggling with either one of these issues, please do share uh, this particular link and, and uh, program with them on your social media platforms so that you're able to uh, pass on the information that's going to come out of uh, the show. So it should be uh, informative and exciting and we look forward to moving to that. So I'm going to now cross over to Michael Bagram. And Michael, this is your second uh, time on CoronaCast and welcome back. Uh, but there's certainly no introduction to broadcast. I mean, you've got a number of radio shows that you do. You're also a very well-respected columnist uh, writing on, on labor issues. And so I couldn't think of anyone better for our CoronaCast viewers uh, to have with us today than you. So welcome to CoronaCast, Michael. Thank you. Uh, my wife always says that I come on the second time to apologize. <laughs> uh, but yes, I've mm. been answering Corona cost issues from the first one. Mm. And of course, I've been doing and dealing with the Department of Employment and Labor mm. now for the seven weeks at least. Mm. It's become an absolute nightmare. So mm. a lot of the people who I've been writing for, and I'm, I know a lot will be watching today, 
Um, we've had a few successes, but I can't say I've been 100% successful. Mm. The department has actually failed the country. Yeah. The Department of Employment and Labor has failed the country, and we need to understand mm. that, and we need to remember that mm. for the future, because we're going to have the same with workmen's compensation. Sure. In two weeks' time, watch this space. Yeah. We'll have that disaster. Now, Michael, um, you also do uh, videos, your own live videos on Facebook. And you share those out there, and uh, obviously you keep people up to date. So CoronaCast viewers who want to be kept up, up to date daily are able to log on to your Facebook, and, and you also distribute them via WhatsApp. And I know yeah. that your committee chairperson uh, in Parliament is very upset that you're talking directly to South Africans. Well, she doesn't want me to report to mm. South Africans because I do report on the news. Mm. And if anything's happened, whether it's disastrous or good, I tell my people, mm. what, what's happening? Okay. And the bottom line is they don't want us to say anything. I know they try to shut down Parliament, and I know you've been very successful mm. in getting committees going again, but in the committees I was roundly pushed and I was muted mm. and told that I had to apologise, withdraw, and Ap promise never to say it again. Apologise for telling the truth. Yeah. Uh, that's well, got to be a is, new one. Which is, which is unfortunately, mm. the, the nature of just mm. about every committee we're mm. seeing in our parliament. Well, there's that famous saying that in times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. So keep telling well. the truth, Michael, and, uh, <laughs> it's like and, the, and like being a revolutionary. The, like the British civil servants, when they go on strike, they refuse to have tea. <laughs> <laughs> well, these days, the way things are going, I think wearing a T-shirt, uh, not as an undergarment, is going to be it's the sign of a revolution. And coming. especially if it's a blue one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> anyway, let's get to some of the questions here, Michael. Um, we had some uh, that came through originally uh, from our, our uh, uh, line, our WhatsApp line. Uh, so Monica... Uh, Brunt says here that she, what about self-employed people that aren't registered? Can, what, what assistance is available for them? Well, certainly not from the Department of Employment and Labor. <laughs> and in fact, we're having a lot of that. Unfortunately, if you haven't been contributing to the Unemployment Insurance Fund, there is no claim whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There is this amount of 350 Rand that they're giving to people um, who are desperately suffering. I haven't seen that money actually coming through, quite mm -hmm. frankly, but from the Department of Employment and Labor, nothing. There is no help whatsoever. And we're finding that with a lot of self-employed people mm -hmm. um, who are coming forward and saying, what do I get? Do I get nothing? And the answer is, yes, you get nothing. The government has made no, no effort at mm -hmm. all to help these people, like we're seeing from governments around the world. Yeah, well, I say my sister is in, is in Ireland. Um, she's out there doing some, some work, and they, their government pays everybody um, Correct. You know, a, a certain stipend every week to, to just keep everyone's heads above water. But it seems here a lot of people, commission earners, that have all just sort of been left, uh, self-employed uh, people, just been left. Uh, they, left. They're called the flotsam and jetsam. Mm. When I say the government has failed the people, mm. this is a perfect example. I can mm. give you hundreds of them, but this is a perfect example mm. of how they failed the workforce of South mm. Africa. And many of these self-employed people actually employ people themselves. You know, they, they're running small businesses. They've got a small repair business the like. And they're not able to work, and they've had to let people go. I mean, well, that, that's the other problem. As you know, the Treasury predicted three to seven million extra mm. retrenchments in South Africa. When we went into this lockdown, we already had almost 10 and a half million unemployed mm. South Africans, and we were the worst in the world. Mm. Imagine adding another, let's be conservative and say another 5 million add to mm. this pile. We've got a real problem. Well, I think economists are now actually saying it's going to be far wider than that. I mean, the figure is starting to edge up to 10 million. And just, I mean, the impact of, I mean, what is the impact? 20 million unemployed people in a country. Well, it's more, what, what un is that? It's more unemployed mm. than if you add all the employed plus all the taxpayers. Mm. You add all that up, we've got more unemployed in this country. It's going to take us years to get out of it, and it's, mm. it's self-inflicted. Mm. It's the lockdown inflicted. We're the worst lockdown in the world, and we've pushed it on ourselves. Mm. And I'd like government to answer as to when they think we're ever going to bounce back. Mm. It's a horrific thought, yeah. but we, we are worrying about it. Okay, well, here's Nsiki Nkani. She's written and she says, If my working hours or days have been reduced during the lockdown period, and I'm receiving half my salary, can I claim the other half from UIF? Yes, you can. Mm. The whole idea being that your employer 
should have actually put in a claim under the mm. TERS, which is the emergency funding under the UIF, mm. for her because she's obviously only earning half or less. Mm. So, yes, the employer was supposed to do it. The minister has opened it up now and said that employees can claim on their own behalf. But you can imagine the disaster with that. Mm. The disaster is they couldn't cope with the amount of companies that claimed. Mm. Now you've got individuals who can claim. I don't know. I think he shot himself in the foot again. Mm. Um, I don't know how many feet our minister's got, but he, mm. he'll keep shooting himself in the, in the feet, specifically because if you can't cope with the companies, how, how are you going to cope, cope with, with the people? And what is it? I mean, because I mean, here we've got Stefan says, how long does it take to get feedback on your UAF claim? And I know I've been dealing with a lot of South mm. African citizens who say, look, we submitted, we've heard nothing. What is, yeah. the, uh, yeah, what is well, the problem? Is it a call center problem? Is it a capacity problem? Uh, why, surely this is the yeah. one time when the UIF should shine. This is their time to shine. This is what they, what they are, are, are developed for. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that South Africa has been suffering under the yoke of poor performance in the Department of Labor across the board. The Department of Labor has got two f functions that pay people out. Mm -hmm. One is the workman's compensation. Well, they haven't been paying people out properly for the last 22 years. And we've got UIF that seems to have fallen apart about 15 years ago. Now, you add that incompetence, whole mm. incompetence, and you add it to a situation now we've got a tsunami of claims that have come through. Even if the commissioner, and bless him, he's a wonderful guy, Commissioner Maruping, he gets back to me within minutes when I write to him, but mm. even if he's working 24 hours a day, Mm. There's just no ways he can do anything about it. He's got staff that are incompetent. Mm. He's got a computer system that's not working. And I know, John, that you called early on in this pandemic, you called early on that it would be handed to SARS to handle the administration. Mm. They eventually listened to you and they saw the disaster. They didn't listen to you in the beginning, and I mm. don't know why. SARS is trying to get it back together again. They're mm. quite a competent administration in mm. SARS, as most of us know. Mm. And... The reality is they are starting to get it flow. But I can't answer the question. People say, how long? Mm, how long, I, is, a piece know, of how long is a piece of string? Mm. I don't actually know. So mm. I'm, everyone that's writing to the DA mm. and we're helping them out, we are getting answers. Mm. But that's a little bit unfair on everyone else because mm. we're going to the top of the queue because mm. we're going straight to the commissioner or the mm. minister, who, by the way, is not talking to me anymore. But mm. um, the, the reality is we're getting somewhere in terms of writing in ourselves. But you can't possibly do this with a million people. Absolutely. So it goes to the heart of the capable state. And you know, in a capable state, you would have social welfare systems that were working. We've seen, and we're going to talk to James a little bit later about SASA, also systems let, let down major collapse. UIF, Workmen's Comp, it's a systems failure and an incapable state. What would fix it? I mean, if you were made Labor, Labor Minister tomorrow, what, what are the few things you would do immediately to fix it? Well, immediately I would go off to civil society and say, help us out. Mm. And the Democratic Alliance has been, we've been begging the minister mm. to hand it over to civil society. For instance, workman compensation, mm. they're going to have a massive amount of claims. As people get sick, they're going to claim compensation that claim should go off to one of the big companies. I don't want to start naming companies here, mm. but or one of the big medical aids. Mm. They, can hand, they can hand over the system, send the names, the IDs, and people will get then their money. There's still money at the moment. Efficiently and effective. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. you can't. You, if you're running a system that's been mm. ineffective for two decades, mm. how can you suddenly multiply it tenfold and then expect it to work? And mm. then you've got some people at the top who are decent people but are just washed okay. over. They, they, they don't know whether they're coming or going. I actually feel sorry for some of the employees in the mm. Department of Employment and Labor. Mm. But we could cure that in minutes. And they agree with me privately when I speak to them. Yeah. Okay, we've got some interesting ones here. Tanache and, some, uh, and uh, Tando have written in about foreign nationals. Are they going to get paid or are they going to be rejected completely? Even though many of them say they've been making the contribution to the UIF, but they're, they're getting rejection. Uh, yeah, well, let, me, let me tell you, that is a complicated question. At the beginning, none of the foreign nationals got paid. They're just mm. blankets. So, okay, it's not a South African ID. Let's not pay them, which is discrimination of the highest order. Um, mm. the Especially minister, since they've been contributing. Well, for years. Mm. The minister then tried to cover this up by saying, well, we were checking to see if their IDs were correct. Then he said, we're checking to see if they got valid work permits. 
and it's taking a long time because we've got to go to home affairs and then they've got to liaise with the department, etc., etc. Well, then they should have checked when the person was contributing in the first place. Mm. I mean, I spoke to a fellow this morning um, uh, who complained on many occasions and he said he's been contributing for over 20 years. Yes, he is a foreigner and yes, he is from Zimbabwe, but he's been contributing and I checked his, his work permit. It's absolutely perfect, no mm. problem. And I've written to the commissioner who says we'll sort him out. So they are trying yeah. to sort out the individuals. But I mean, it seems that they were happy to take the money. But now, Always. you know, now that there's time to, you know, to, to balance the equation, uh, it's, it's not the, being done. The colour of money from anyone is the same. Absolutely. Um, Belinda Landsberg writes here, I've worked the whole month full time, but being told that my salary is dependent on UIF. Is this legal? No, absolutely not. Mm. They should have negotiated with her up front. Yes, there mm. are some employers that are saying, we're struggling. Mm. Can we do a deal with you? Can you take 70% of your income or 20%? Whatever they've done, as long as there's an agreement, they can't just unilaterally change it. I must just tell everyone, and people keep asking me this, mm. these regulations, first of all, most of them are incomprehensible. Uh, mm. Second of all, most of them at, at the end of the day are illegal. Um, and... What's, what the minister's trying to do, and we're finding it in other departments as well, is they're trying to regulate to almost expunge the law. Now, you can't do that. A regulation cannot, cannot, cannot uh, trump law. the law. Yeah. Cannot trump law. And the bottom line is if you're working, you're entitled to your salary. Mm. That's the bottom line. And if the people can't pay, then they must either retrench you or they must negotiate. Mm. Monique Ballard writes, is your company allowed to suspend their contribution to the Provident Fund during this time uh, while it's part of cost to company? Uh, they say they're not going to make it up at a later stage. Well, if they're not going to make it up, then they certainly can't just do that. Again, that's changing the terms the and conditions of your employment mm. illegally. Everyone is doing it because they're doing it through negotiation, mm. consultation and discussion. And yes, I deal with companies all the time and I've said go and speak to the staff. Tell them what the problem is. Mm. Talk to the uh, whoever it is that you're dealing with. I won't name companies again. Mm. But a lot of the provident companies are saying, and the pension firms are saying, all right, let's take a three-month break. Okay, yeah. We'll make it up at the end, but let's mm. take the break. But we want agreement from mm. the staff. Mm. Here what we're having is a question of someone who just unilaterally thrust upon her, not mm. fair and not right. Johan Barkhazen, can domestic workers claim on UIF? Yes, they can. Provided they've been, Provided they've been registered in the first place. Okay. Now, the problem is that we've got about a million domestic workers in South Africa. Mm. The Minister of Employment and Labour decided to boast that we've had over 14,000 claims and we've mm. sorted them out. Now, 14,000 claims from domestic workers and we've got a million employed. There's mm. some problem there. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't tell South Africa that. He boasts about the 14,000. Mm. But yes, they can claim as long as they're registered. If they're not registered... A lot of people haven't registered the domestic workers. They can do so now. You pay back, it's only 2%, get them registered and then claim. Mm. And the department is not punishing you for that and not penalizing you. You're not paying any extra money. You're paying purely the 2%. Pay mm. it in, get them registered. Mm. That's a silver lining to this TERS uh, mm. claim in that people are now being... Uh, sort of almost mm. cajoled into registering. I mean, imagine domestic, domestic work. workers must be under a lot of pressure at this time. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, they've not been allowed to you know, to operate, etc. And I think a lot of employers are starting to reach the end of their ability to pay. To They're pay. also taking pressure. So it's very important that that if you have a domestic worker that hasn't been registered, that you do follow this route. So how would that happen, Michael? Would they just go to... It's simple. You do it online and you don't have okay. to go in. It's, it's actually, this is one of the more simple areas within mm. that, uh, if mm. you can get online, of course, because mm. half the time they're down. Mm. Let me just tell you one other little thing about domestic workers, mm. and it's important to understand, but under mm. the level four where we are, a domestic worker can come to work mm. if she's going to be looking after children, the elderly... The infirm or those that are mentally unstable. Mm. If you've got someone like that in the household and you need the domestic worker to come in, she can come in and mm. do that and then earn her salary and her keep mm. and or his keep. A and the bottom line is domestic workers are the most downtrodden of the workforce. Let's look after them. Salaries mm. are not an enormous fortune. And I've said to a lot of people that I speak to daily, I said, 
at least pay something towards the domestic worker mm. who is sitting at home, can't put anything on the table, and they're looking after a family. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Eldert van Weingart writes here, he's got a message that uh, his claim has again been rejected, no reason or explanation. Uh, what, would that, what would cause that, and what, what, is re what recourse does he have? Well, the recourse is, there's no legal recourse, but mm -hmm. what, what I would suggest is that they write to you, like mm -hmm. um, most of our people are writing to mm -hmm. the leader at the DA, mm -hmm. and we are sorting them out. Okay. We take a few days to do it, but we are sorting mm -hmm. it out. All I need is his registration number, the ID number, mm -hmm. and I need the company's mm -hmm. name or his personal name if he's employing mm -hmm. the person personally or if it's him. Mm -hmm. We will get it sorted mm -hmm. out. So... Um, Eldet, please send your, uh, send your uh, email query with all the details to uh, info at coronacast, uh, sorry, coronavirus at da.org.za. So that's coronavirus at da.org.za, and we'll see what we can do to sort it out. Um, Kenneth Adams writes, I really need help. Our accounting department made a mistake with UIF reference number when claiming for TERS. They've corrected the information, but are unable to claim again. Claim is unsuccessful for individuals that have been submitted already. Any idea or advice on how they can redo Again, it? Again, we, we need to then write to the commissioner. Commissioner mm. Marupeng is answering those. This is a common thing that we're getting, that they immediately then block you out of the system. Mm. And a lot of people are just giving up. Don't give up. Okay. It's your money. It, the, the money that sits in the UIF actually belongs to the people, mm. to your employees. It does not belong to, to the government and to mm. the president. Mm. And he was gaily saying that I'm going to use it for my half a trillion rand mm. funding. I'm taking money out of it. It's not his. It's mm. trust money that belongs to the people. Mm. They keep saying, and they've said this for years, that this money is for a rainy day. Well, it's raining. If, if it's really raining, now it's pouring. <laughs> yeah. Let's use that money for the people. It needs to be cascaded down to the employees. Yeah. And surely the quicker you can get the money into the system, isn't that the trick? Yes. I mean, and you know, this is what other people you know, buy food do. and yeah. buy a jersey and, and just get going. But also there's a demand and supply side to it. So the, you know, if you get this money quickly into the system, into the workers' accounts, they then can go to the shop and support the shopkeeper. Who then buys goods. Who yeah. then buys goods. So you, you get the supply chain going again. And I think that's a you know, point that's been missed. The, the, the blockages in this really affect the, you know, both the supply and the demand side of the economy very, very badly. Well, this is old economics. Yeah. They, we had it in the New Deal in yeah. America. Yeah. Get it going. And yeah. our government doesn't see that. Yeah. If a company, Taryn writes here, if a company cuts your salary by agreement and then gets paid TERS, should they be paying TERS above your pay cut to make up the deficit? Well, it's, it's a complicated one. It depends very much on the agreements. Mm. The company's not, but you can't, the company can't grab the TERS money. Mm. That's your money. That yeah. must be paid over to you. Only if the company paid you in full mm. can they then they keep, keep the, the TERS, TERS money. money. Otherwise, they must pay it over to you. Mm. You can't earn more. I've had some people yeah. phone me and say, well, this is fantastic. I've earned 110% of my salary. Not on, mm. and you're cheating government then. Mm. I know people are angry with government, but don't cheat. Yeah. Let's make sure it works and properly. And everyone gets a fair. Yeah. Um, can an employer take away your annual leave in lieu of days off you have to spend in lockdown? They can, yes, in terms mm. of the basic conditions of Employment Act. And we mm. remember our first corona cost, we yeah. discussed that. And the minister said, no, you can't. Don't listen to the minister. He hadn't read the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. It's the most basic of any legislation. He forgot to read it. And he said, no, they can't make it leave, but you can. You, as an employer, can choose when the employees take leave, and you mm. can unilaterally tell them. And a lot of companies have been paying you out your leave pay because you don't want the lockdown to be lifted and everyone say, OK, cool, now we'll take leave. Yeah. You don't want that. You want to get back to work. So they've been economy, paying you out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ruben van Staden wrote in to us earlier in the week and said, was the corona UIF relief only for April or for the duration of the lockdown? Uh, if he's lost his job during the lockdown, would he still be able to claim? Yes, but that's not TERS. He'd be able to claim UIF, UIF. for the loss of the job unless he resigned. Okay. But if it was any other reason, a retrenchment or any other reason, he's entitled to claim. Mm. And yes, it's not only for the lockdown. You're supposed to be getting your pay for May as well. Um, in their wisdom, they haven't opened up the claims yet as mm. of this morning. Mm. 
mm. and we what are we the 18th what mm. what's the date now of, of may we yeah. we right through may and yet they haven't opened up the claims for may i'm mm. not i'm not sure what the hell they're doing right. michael i mean while we here let's just talk about you know because a lot of people are saying what's going to happen when, when we go back after this you know, mm. what does a post corona world look like we know that <clears throat> our labor laws are some of the most restrictive in the world. Mm. And uh, you know, government adopted some of those minimum wage uh, decisions beforehand. And you were very vocal in parliament about mm. why they would stifle employment. And Treasury itself said there were millions of jobs that would be lost as a result of it. Do, do, you, do you think that this is a time for us to have a relook at our labor regime in South Africa, given the fact we could have you know, 17 to 20 million unemployed South Africans to stimulate job creation. I mean, surely this Ab is an opportunity for us to, to relook at it. Well, it's not just us. The country should be relooking mm. at it. And you're quite right. Mm. Um, my colleague, uh, Honorable Dr. Michael Carter, Carter mm. is in fact rewriting mm. some of our own policy to have a look at this very mm. carefully. I've been working with him mm. on that. The bottom line is we put this to NEDLAC, which is the debating chamber. Mm made up of government, big business and big trade unions, and we put it to them saying, shouldn't they be looking at it? Obviously, it can't be business as usual. Mm. We are suffering the worst unemployment in the world, mm. and it's getting worse. It's not as if we're turning the corner. It's getting worse. Mm. And they said they haven't put it on their agenda yet. I, I, I almost fell off my chair mm. when I was listening to this. So we were sitting in a, um, a Zoom conference, and I could not believe hearing this from mm. them. We, as the Democratic Alliance, are looking at this very carefully because we need to make sure that people actually can get back to work and work could be starting to mm. re-employ people. Everyone I speak to is busy retrenching at the moment because in this country today, it's easier to get a divorce than to dismiss someone. Mm. I mean, it's just a ridiculous state of affairs. Yeah. So, Instead of going through that exercise, you'd rather say, I won't, I won't employ. Yeah. Well, we can't, have, we can't afford that anymore. Do you think there are some companies that are going to use this crisis as an opportunity to retrench, uh, to retrench well, and are. reduce their work? Their work Absolutely. Work? All of them are, yeah. unfortunately. And a lot can't see into the future. Yeah. I speak to small businesses every day, hundreds of small businesses. And a lot of them are saying, well, even if they pull off the lockdown, they've now killed me. Mm. Um, now I've got to actually start retrenching. And some companies have said, well, we know we've been overstaffed anyway before this. Yeah. Let's use this opportunity now mm. to retrench. Now, it's the wrong thing to do. Mm. What we're hoping to do is to ensure that the companies will survive, mm. at least survive in the short term, and then they're off to thrive. Mm. And we need to change the regulations mm. to make them thrive. So what they need is essentially a bridge. We see coronavirus as a river, and it's flowing very strongly, and it's causing devastation. We need to give businesses a bridge over it so they can keep going because trying to breathe life into a dead economy uh, is going to be very difficult afterwards. You should rather just try and keep your as many businesses as possible on life support till, till you get yeah. over that bridge. Well, Surely, that, that bridge you talk about is not mm. necessarily money. Mm. That bridge is very cheap. All you mm. do is deregulate. Mm. It's quite simple. Yeah. So you take small businesses and you remove them from the yoke of the bargaining councils. That would open up another million businesses in this country. Mm -hmm. And you can take any of the regulations that exist at the moment and ensure that everything that stifles business, mm -hmm. we used to call it the handbrake to business, mm -hmm. take that handbrake and loosen it. Yeah. Let government take its filthy paws off the small business community and let's yeah. make it work. People yeah. need jobs. Everyone needs a job. Yeah. Families, whole families are reporting that there's not one person in our family working. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's not sustainable. And uh, quite frankly, when I go to bed at night, you can't sleep when you're thinking of that. Yeah. It's a problem. Um, Michael, here we go. Um, if a company, from Monique Ballard, if a company cuts your salary between 20 to 35% and are not paying you overtime, are you still entitled to work your full 160 hours a month? Or how should your hours be affected with a cut salary and you're not on the short time? Well, again, it's negotiation. Mm. It's discussion. Mm. People are, in fact, saying to the companies, let's keep this alive. I'll work 100% of the time, mm. but I'll take a 70% mm. or a 60%. And mm. staff are doing that because they want to keep their jobs alive. They want to keep their company alive. And that's mm. good of them. And the employer is desperately mm. trying to keep the company going. If there's no agreement on that, then they can't force you. Again, the legislation says 
You get paid per hour. And if you're working 50% of your time, then you get paid 50% of your salary. Yeah. Or if you were getting 50% of your salary, you can say, I don't want to work full time. Yeah. But I am asking people, let's, we're in this together. Yeah. It's a boat that has developed a really bad leak. If we can somehow plug up that leak, even yeah. if it takes more hours, do that. Yeah. We're asking people to work. We want this economy to survive. And if anything, the Democratic Alliance wants South Africa mm. to thrive, no matter who's in government. We mm. want the company to, yeah. companies to survive through mm. this and for then in turn to pay their taxes and mm. let's have the country mm. survive. Deline Blackman asks us, what happens if, you're only working if, if you only have 15 working days leave, then afterwards does it become no work, no pay after your annual leave is deducted? Now, if you're not working, no work, no pay. Basic conditions of Employment Act mm. is the simplest uh, solution out of that, mm. unfortunately. Mm. People are hard sore about it because it's not through fault of theirs that they're not coming to work. Mm. The companies are hard sore because they're not earning any profit out of mm. them. But it's no work, no pay. That's mm. the bottom line. Um, Anna Berta Gerard asks, for how many months can companies claim from UF on behalf of their staff as they're working but not being paid as the company's not able to URF uh, for March or April was received. Can the company claim for May? Yes, absolutely. Okay. How, long like, you, can you, how long can you claim? Well, May? the minister keeps changing the regulations. Okay. We weren't it was supposed to be three months. Okay. But it was April, May. Um, mm. Obviously, May is going to be... We might have mm. to go into June. Okay. Uh, of course, if we've still got funding in the, in the UIF, that's a, a million-dollar question or the $60 million question. Mm. Kerry Lee ask you again here, lots of people writing and I've made claims, I've heard nothing back, I've been rejected, I've got no reason for the rejection. Must people just keep resubmitting? They must keep resubmitting and like we say, we're at least opening our doors to try mm. and help as many as we can. Mm. Obviously the deluge is coming our way as well because yeah. of the incompetence of the department. Mm. But yes, mm. the problem is of course you can't put in the make claim. I think it's, uh, well I checked this morning, you couldn't do it mm. yet. Okay. this morning and the department was saying to me that I must be patient but I mean mm. gee whiz um, it's become an impossible problem. Andres van Dijk writes, how do workers know if a company being paid, is being paid out UIF and not just taking that money for themselves? Well yes but it's worse. Let me tell you mm. what's worse. Companies actually do want to pay out their employees. What's happening mm. on the UIF website mm. they've printed that company X has received a hundred thousand rand. Mm. And so you must get hold, and people are going onto the website and say, oh, great, my company's got it. They phone the company and say, we haven't got the money. Well, the problem is, I've, I've spoken to a lot of these companies, they haven't actually got it. Mm. So the website is saying it's been paid. The people are looking and saying, this is great, and the company mm. is saying it's not. And then who do you start distrusting? Yeah. The mistrust is unbelievable. Mm. And I think, I'm almost starting to think mm. that's mischievous on the part of the department. Yeah. What what they're trying to do. Yeah. It, it is madness. Yeah. So it's obviously setting workers and, and empl employers That's against it. each other. And the minister, in mm. fact, went one step further and he mm. said, because of this, I'm going to ask employees to claim directly. Mm. But if they couldn't cope... Yeah, they're not going to cope. They're anymore. not going to cope. Lazan asks here, can an employer change your employment contract in terms of medical aid contributions? No, unilateral. unilateral. You can only do that or she can only do it by negotiation. negotiation. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, obviously, we'll keep the questions coming in, but I do want to spend uh, a bit of time with James Lorimer, who joins us today uh, as our studio guest from Joburg via an online platform. Um, so today, James, interestingly enough, the ANC in the Western Cape called for the suspension of the mayor of Cape Town, Dan Plato, for refusing to stop feeding the poor under lockdown. Uh, I've never heard of, of anything quite as ridiculous as that, uh, to want to stop a mayor from feeding poor people who are hungry. Um, and so this ties in quite nicely with the segment that we want to do, do with you. And I know that we've laid a complaint with the Human Rights Commission over government's restriction on the food parcel distribution. And I'm also told that uh, we'll be announcing some new court action against the Minister of Social Development. Do you want to just take us through that? Yeah, if I can start at the beginning. Mm. You know, when lockdown was announced, obviously a lot of people immediately lost their jobs or informal businesses and small businesses lost their means of making a livelihood. 
And um, pretty soon people's savings started running out and they fell back on food relief organizations, charities and churches and so forth, of which there are a huge network feeding people across the country. 12 days ago, it got a lot worse because the National Department of Social Development issued a draft regulations restricting the way that food could be distributed. I mean, draft regulations, their status is very unclear. But what has happened is that officials of the department and in some places, police officers have started implementing these new regulations. There's a lot of confusion about them. So what do these regulations do? Well, two things mainly. Firstly, they say soup kitchens are not allowed to operate. Now, this is a problem because one of the most efficient, quick ways of feeding people is through a soup kitchen. You set it up, people who need it come. Now, obviously there are problems with that as well, with social distancing and so on, but it's not impossible to run a, to run a soup kitchen. Nevertheless, mm. soup kitchens have been shut down. I'll, I'll give you an example of one of the problems that are caused by the alternative, which is a food parcel. In, in my own constituency in Johannesburg, in Windsor, the people who stay in flats who get the dry goods that you get in a food parcel, but they don't have any money for electricity. So you find them in the garden of their flat complex making fires to cook milli meal. So uh, that could be far better catered for by a soup kitchen. That was the first thing. The second thing that these draft regulations do is they restrict how food parcels can be delivered. And they say that um, you can get permission from the department to give out food parcels. So you need a license to give out food parcels, but you have to apply Sorry, James, for... I'm just going to stop there. You've got a, a yeah. license to feed hungry people. Quite right. As mad as it sounds, you need to go to the department. And you can't just get a license once. You have to get a license, a new license for every day that you want to operate. And this is from the Department of Social Development, which is a shambles. I know of at least one major food relief organization in Joburg last week who decided, right, let's go through the process. They gave them three days notice. They said, on Friday, can we have a license to go out and give out food parcels? They heard nothing. But so, James, what would be the logic behind stopping NGOs from giving food parcels? You know, I've said so many times on this show and on other forums, what SASA should have done is given private NGOs their contract to go and do SASA food parcels because we've seen SASA a complete disaster in terms of uh, of their food parcel relief, uh, you know, parcels finding their way into politicians' homes, you know, being divvied, uh, divvied up uh, according to political affiliations. Surely it would make sense to give this project to people who work with hungry, poor people every single day and get them to get on with it. And they should be being supported by SASA. One would think so. There is already this huge network, as I said earlier, of uh, relief organizations across the country, and some of them are very locally placed. They know exactly where the problems are. At a stroke, what government has tried to do is just shut them down. And it has come forward and said, OK, we'll take over the distribution of food. Now, of course, this is nonsense because they're just simply incapable. I could reel off a list of names of towns where not a single food parcel has been delivered. And yet the people who were issuing food relief have been closed down. Uh, so you're in the situation, and, and we come back to the, the very first story that, that you talked about, where an ANC member is accusing the Cape Town mayor of the great crime of giving out food parcels without a license. It is the most outrageously foolish thing. Now, you asked for the logic behind this. I don't know if there is logic, but there have been various excuses used by... Uh, Department of Social Development people and ANC people. They say, for example, that they can only they at a central point can make sure everybody's getting the same amount of food. Well, that's nonsensical. They've also tried to use the excuse that no, before food aid is given out, it must be checked over by health department officials so they can make sure that the food is not bad. Now, this is going to organizations which have been giving people food, have been feeding people, for months, years in some cases, all of a sudden you impose these restrictions as an, uh, or these reasons as an excuse for why all food distribution must be centralized. And of course, that comes into this as well. They say, oh, no, no, we're not stopping you giving out food. You can come and give all your resources to the department and the department will hand it out. And of course, that's not happening. 
Mm. Well, I mean, it would be all right, <coughs> I suppose, uh, and, you know, there might be a, an argument, I'm saying might be an argument, if you were dealing with an efficient, effective uh, operation that was able to do its task. But we saw last month, they, SASA couldn't even pay out the grants to people. Some people got double, some people didn't get any. They say it's a glitch in the system. But this is a, a hopelessly inefficient uh, body now, basically saying, well, don't worry, we're going to take it all over and we're going to go out and do it. It just doesn't make sense to me. And there's no way that the minister could not know that. I don't believe for a moment that even Minister Ndiwe Zulu believes that the Social Development Department is an efficient department. So we're left with the, the, the alternatives. Either this is being done because the government and the minister are so massively incompetent that they think that they're <coughs> sitting in an organization that will be able to take over the feeding of South Africans. Hmm. Or there is another motive, perhaps uh, the, the idea that they need to centralize hmm. control over the food system. This has been talked about. The um, ANC's policy of national democratic revolution talks about everything being put in the center, government controlling everything. Some people are speculating that this is what they're trying to do to the system of food distribution, yeah. in which case is absolutely a, wicked. But it's a real, real folly for government to not to try and crowd out civil society. You know, this is a one opportunity where civil society could partner with government. The government should be giving them support. Uh, to feed hungry people, to, to fulfill their mandate, and, and yet we're seeing them you know, trying to crowd out now uh, civil what society. You're doing, yeah, what you're doing at the stroke of a pen is you're taking a system that is working and you're closing it down mm. in favor of a system that hasn't got a hope of working, yeah. which, as you said earlier, the DA has decided to take this to court. We think these regulations are um, illegal, Mm. and certainly immoral. Mm. Any government that stops its people from being fed has no right to govern, as far as I'm concerned. Now, James, you've been heading up our uh, Shadow Cabinet subcommittee work stream on food security and, and food. How widespread is this problem around the country? How, what, are the, what is the information that, that you have been able to determine out just how widespread hunger is and what a big humanitarian crisis it is for us at this moment? Very difficult to say. All I can say is tens of thousands. Mm. The story is reported on very badly by the mainstream media, but we do know from dozens of food relief organizations that their work has been hampered. And one of them, uh, a representative of one of these organizations was talking to me uh, just last week and saying it's taking an emotional toll on the people who work for these organizations. She said, she just got off the phone with a grown man, as she described it, in tears, mm. because she had that she could not come and deliver the food parcels that he expected because of these new regulations. Mm. The human cost is horrific. How many people are affected? I don't know. I would guess mm. hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions. Yeah. And also, I mean, the other thing is we saw over the weekend, James, uh, one of the, the leading team uh, at a national level on the, uh, on the health front coming out saying they're starting to see malnutrition cases in much greater numbers coming through at, at, at public hospitals, people coming in with malnutrition, young children, malnutrition. And obviously, you know, when you're fighting a virus, the worst thing you need is a compromised immune system. And malnutrition is one of the easiest ways to compromise an immune system and make people susceptible not only to COVID, but also now to the seasonal flus and, and uh, illnesses that we're going to start see coming through. And that's the crazy thing about these regulations. I mean, we're already in the midst of a debate about the lockdown. How fast should it be lifted? And we know that we cannot afford to go on as we have been because the economy needs to start working to generate wealth for people to feed themselves. On top of this, you now get these regulations saying that the relief efforts are illegal. That's just unconscionable. I don't know what the government is thinking. Mm. So what are we doing? We're going to court and what else are we going to do, James? We're going to court. Um, I've written to the Human Rights Commission. Um, I did that last uh, end of last week. Uh, they did acknowledge uh, my letter on Friday, said that they would look into it. I don't know. What's how the fast... basis of, of you writing to the Human Rights Commission? Well, um, the basis was really twofold. The, the, the two um, uh, effects of the regulations, as I spelt out a little earlier, 
one on the soup kitchens, the other one on the restriction of the delivery of food parcels. So um, that's going and we, we, we do think it, that breaches the constitution in several instances. You know, there's a, a, a part of the constitution um, which specifies that everybody has the right to sufficient food and water. Mm. Government has just taken that right away from people. So I think solely on that, you would have a case for saying that these regulations are illegal and the sooner we can get them overturned, the better. Mm. Great. Well, thank you, James. And thanks. Uh, we'll obviously keep CoronaCast viewers uh, updated on this as it proceeds. And hopefully on Friday, I'll be able to give some more details on the court action. But thanks for joining us and thanks for the work that you're doing to try and make sure that we feed hungry people in South Africa and that government gets out of the way of those people who are better, best qualified to do it. Uh, you know, the clunking fist of state needs to stick to its job and let civil society do what it knows uh, what to do best. So thank you for that. Thank you, Michael, as well, for being in the studio today. It's been really great having you back. And I'm sure we're going to have you uh, back um, during uh, the course of the of the time uh, of uh, the coronavirus as well as. But thank you for what you're doing as well, uh, answering queries. Uh, keep up with your show and please keep your videos coming. Even if they uh, annoy the, your, your chairperson, your portfolio committee, keep them coming. Never stop speaking truth to power. Uh, so thank you, Michael, for that. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I've got an interesting question uh, that came through from uh, Johan Rulofsa, and I think it goes to the heart of the court challenge that we've been putting in place. He says, who's actually running the lockdown? Well, uh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, the, it appears the National Command Council uh, is running the response. And when asked who the National Command Council is accountable to, we've received the answer that it is cabinet. Now, it is an absurd situation in a parliamentary democracy to have an executive that accounts to itself. Uh, the Constitution is very clear that all organs of state must be accountable to parliament. And as the people's representatives, uh, we need to exercise oversight of the executive. Uh, many of the viewers would know that uh, right at the beginning, in fact, in the first week uh, of the uh, lockdown uh, issue, uh, we tried to get Parliament to set up an ad hoc committee to exercise oversight of the NCC from Parliament's side, uh, and it was refused. I think Parliament's let the people of the country down by not doing that. And I think that when the story is written, uh, it's going to uh, show Parliament up uh, for once again, as we saw in the Nkandla case, uh, letting down the people of South Africa by not insisting that it uh, fulfills its constitutional mandate of exercising oversight of the executive. They've essentially allowed the National Command Council uh, and the executive uh, to make laws, to make regulations that have far-reaching and profound implications for every single one of us as citizens without a stitch of oversight and without any input from the elected legislative uh, branch of South Africa. That forms the basis of our challenge to the Disaster Management Act. And we hope that the Constitutional Court will A, grant us a direct access and B, will hear this urgently because I think many, many South Africans are asking uh, who is running the show and why are these decisions being made? Uh, we need to end the lockdown crisis now and start to get South Africa and South Africans back to work as safely as possible at all times, insisting on PPE, the use of masks, as practicing social distancing, bans on big gatherings, and being able to uh, screen, test, and trace. And so that will form the basis uh, of the challenge. I think if we are successful in this, many of these irrational and unreasonable bans, particularly on alcohol, tobacco, whole hosts of other product, uh, uh, products are going to be undermined and shown up for what they are. We've already seen the ridiculous regulations that were published last week by Minister Patel telling us what we can buy as clothing and how uh, we as citizens should wear it. This has got absolutely nothing to do with combating the virus and it's only uh, the dream of petty bureaucrats who want to use this as an opportunity to bring about their centrally planned economy and their madcap ideas that they've had waiting in the wings for many, many years. We will support any measures that are effective and efficient in combating the COVID virus. But as citizens, we should all resist the yoke 
of oppressive regulations that are designed to fulfill ideological uh, propositions rather than being effective uh, in allowing us to be able to combat the virus. That's all we've got time for this week, South Africa. I hope you've enjoyed the show. It's been great having Michael and James on, and we'll keep you posted on, uh, on those uh, issues. Remember, you can submit any questions that you may have to coronavirus at da.org.za. Don't forget that web address. And then also don't forget, uh, if you've missed out on some information, you're looking for an informa uh, uh, some information, you've seen something on a previous show and you want to go back to it, remember our dedicated website, www.da.org.za forward slash defeating coronavirus. It's a one-stop shop for you to be able to get your frequently asked questions. There's a wealth of information about all the funds, about how you can go about making those applications. Uh, so please do use that resource. Uh, thank you very, very much for tuning in. I'll see you all here, same time, same place, on Friday, uh, 2 p.m. for the next edition of CoronaCast. Until then... Stay safe, South Africa.